This is Rick Peterson, Nigel's husband. The following episode of Ear Hustle contains language that may not be appropriate for all listeners. Discretion is advised. There is a tray that we are going to use for our food every day, three times a day. Um, I'm going to say it's about maybe 13 by nine inches, something like that. And it has one, two, three, four, five, six different slots. Then there's a spork and it's red. And then there's a red um, tumbler that we're going to drink out of. It's made out of some kind of rubber. Uh, it does not have a pleasing smell. I assume that the smell will change over time when I start using it, but it's going to be weird to be drinking everything out of this tumbler, which I'm guessing doesn't hold a lot. It looks like it holds maybe, maybe eight ounces. I remember when this big box arrived at my doorstep. This is when the Ear Hustle 30-day challenge really became concrete. And you were amped up, mm. Nige. I know people have said, "Mm, you got to be careful. You can't act like you're too excited about this. I I mean, what the fuck? I am excited about it. Not because I think I'm going to replicate life in prison, but because I'm going to explore something new. And when you explore something new, you learn things about yourself and you learn things about other people and you're going to see life in a different way. So for me, that's exciting. Indeed. And I think this is going to be a different kind of episode for us. Erlon, I mean, that's just the creative process. You've got to change. You've got to move forward. Let's do it. I'm Erlon Woods. I'm Nigel Poor, and this is Ear Hustle from PRX's Radiotopia. Okay, so opening my, my package with all the, the stuff for the 30-day challenge, um, there's a binder that is maybe two and a half inches thick, and it's broken down into weeks. And when you open it up, there's a shopping list for each week that's a couple pages long, and then every day is broken down by menu. This past October... Ear Hustle did something we've never tried before. We called it the 30-Day Challenge, an experiment where some of our team tried to see what it was like to live under a set of constraints, inspired and informed by our colleagues inside San Quentin. We're always talking about all those crazy rules and shit. Mm -hmm. This was a chance to kind of try them out yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So definitely Life Inside San Quentin was one of the inspirations for the 30-Day Challenge, but Another inspiration was this artist I really admire, the durational performance artist, Dorshing Che, whose work explores a lot of things, but really in the forefront of everything he does, he's thinking about constraint and freedom and how those two things might possibly work together. Yeah, this sounds like your type of shit, Nige. Extreme. <laughs> you know what it is. So for example, Dorshing Che did this one piece where for a whole year he lived in a cage that he had built for himself in a studio and he didn't allow himself a radio or TV or books. He couldn't even talk to people. He just had to sit there and be sustained by his own thoughts for a full year. I mean, Erlon, isn't that wild? Hell yeah, that's wild. I couldn't do no shit like that. It's like a voluntary prison. The Ear Hustle Challenge was pretty different. For one, it wasn't just one person. There were several of us on the outside team doing the challenge. A whole bunch of listeners joined in, and then guys inside were acting as kind of our coaches. Yep, I mean, they are the experts in prison, right? Mm Mm-hmm. But another difference is that the 30-day challenge wasn't one single big challenge. It was a whole bunch of stuff. Right, and we were not trying to reproduce prison. We picked a handful of rules that govern how incarcerated people live. Like, we wore a certain set of clothes, ate a prescribed prison breakfast, and we did a workout based on what our colleagues inside San Quentin do. And Erlon, as you know, those were just some of the rules. And of course, y'all were documenting the whole thing with pictures and audio diaries and all that. It was pretty intense, not? Yeah, well, Erlon, you know, if you don't document and archive something, (laughs) did it really happen? Right. (laughs) 
And I know at the end of it, when it came time to produce this show, you all were like, no way are we going to get all this into one episode. No, I mean, it was just too much. So today we're talking about a couple of parts of the challenge, including one big one. Um, Erlon, something you and I love? Eating? Eating, yes, eating. And the food part of the 30-day challenge all began with that box you were talking about just a minute ago, Nige. So you see what you're going to eat, and then you have a visual of what your tray is going to look like, where you're going to put each of your food items into each slot. It is, like I said, a, maybe two and a half inch thick binder. It is a lot of information. Yep, the box. Every week inside San Quentin, the kitchen staff posts a menu of what's being served in the chow hall. And our team gave a month's worth of these menus to a dietitian who specialized in prison food. And she created a one-person version. A month-long food plan with recipes and this insanely detailed shopping list. So I just want to read some of it. Um, this is for one week. Dinner roll, hamburger buns, 100% apple juice, coffee, sour cream, liquid eggs, 1% milk, vitamin fortified drink mix, frozen waffles, pancakes, frozen or mixed, frozen, carrots, navy beans dry, celery, onions, peas, Italian locale dressing, corn, fried potato slices, pinto beans dry, broccoli cuts, margarine, sliced American yellow cheese, shredded Green cabbage, cheese, yellow shredded onion, onion, apple, banana, cheese. orange, one each day at lunch. Assorted individual snacks, two per day. For example, granola You bar, showed it to me. Chips. I mean, dozens mm -hmm. of recipes. Recipes with really specific instructions on how to make all the meals that guys in prison eat. Jumbo cheese ravioli, three each. Creamy cucumber and sandwich. onion salad, four ounces. Hard-boiled egg. To eat. Italian tomato sauce and kidney beans. Chicken Texas hash, six ounces. Turkey bacon, two slices. Kinto beans, four ounces. Glazed strawberry topping. Pudding, four ounces. Boneless chicken breast sandwich. Chicken Texas hash. Fruit serving with size, vitamin C. Three quarters of a cup. One percent milk, eight ounces. Coffee, Turkey eight bologna, ounces. Two ounces. And Wheat I knew bread, this was going to be a huge challenge for me, Muslim in part because Erlon, you know this about me. I'm a pretty specific eater. I mean, I have a routine and it's my routine. So it was weird to hand that control over to somebody else. I have the same thing for breakfast. I have the same lunch and I tend to eat the same dinner three to four nights a week. I can't do that on this challenge. Every meal is different. So actually I'm finding stress thinking about the variety of food I'm going to eat. And I know this is supposed to be about constraint and deprivation, but when I look at the menus, I think, oh my God, every night I'm going to have to cook a different meal. One of the first things you did was bring in the binder with all those menus to show the guys inside. We have... New York, and Rashid, and Tony. And I wanted to share with you our, our menu plan for the 30-day challenge. I want to know what you all think of it. So each day has our breakfast, lunch, and dinner laid out and where we need to put stuff in the tray. That's what we had wow. today, waffles. <laughs> that's right on point with Monday. <laughs> Turkey bologna sandwich, that's what I threw in the trash today. <laughs> that's what we got tonight, Italian meat sauce. Whoa, when mass producing garlic bread, you can see the similar instructions are different than how you normally make this at home. What kind of bread is that? Garlic, garlic bread. bread. Oh, you said garlic. I was like, garlic, garlic, garlic. garlic. That's garlic. That's the it's coming out in garlic. garlic. New York and Rashid and Tony were going through the binder, and New York got stuck on this one recipe for garlic bread. Hmm. Yeah, we get garlic bread once in a while, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was so good. It was so good. What was good about it? It was this golden brown I've never seen before. It was like extremely brown, but without being burnt at all. Crispy. And it was, yeah, and it was saturated with butter. When you touched it, you, you, it felt like you were squeezing butter out. Yeah. And it was delicious. If someone made it with care. Someone made it with care. There's that one magical week, two, three weeks ago, where that angel came through the kitchen and then left us with the rest of this crap. That was the day. same day as the chicken. The same day as the chicken patty was cor cooked correctly. It but doesn't like, that show you, like, it is, it's how it's prepared? It is definitely how it's prepared. Yeah. Uh, uh, you haven't committed a crime? 
I don't know if you deserve for the food to be cooked the way it's cooked for us. I'm gonna try my best. I don't, I don't know if I want you to. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I got a confession to make, Nige. Uh huh. Need to be straight with all the listeners. Always. I did not get a <laughs> box. I mean, I support you, love you, but this challenge thing, I can't do it, <laughs> Nige. I, I, I cannot <laughs> sign on to eating that food ever again <laughs> in my life. Plus, oh, plus, man. I've only been in society for a few years. What, three years now? So mm -hmm. I'm still getting used to this free people food, you know? Yeah, Erlon, I totally understand why you feel that way. I mean, you ate that way for decades. And I know our sound designer, Antoine, who's also formerly incarcerated, had a similar reaction. The first Monday when our Slack, we was, it was photos of the trays of like what people were eating for breakfast. And I was just like, you know, it just, it just brought back it just brought me back to the sense of like, I have traumas around prison, you know, and you're just seeing those meals. And it's like, like, ah, oh, like the worst times of my life. Like that was literally mm -hmm. it. Obviously, Erlon, before we started this, we asked ourselves a lot of questions. Like, what does it mean to voluntarily take on some of the constraints of prison life when obviously we were never going to replicate prison. Yeah, and that's something that came up when we invited listeners to join in on a challenge, you know? Mm -hmm. We yep. put up all the menus and recipes online and we started getting responses. And I know yep. a couple of them felt that this was almost like making fun of incarcerated people. That was something we ended up talking about a lot with the guys inside, especially with New York and our friend Reggie. What would you say if somebody said that for people in the street to try to emulate people in prison by trying to do this 30-day challenge, but it's not real. They're just playing it's, with it because, hold on, let me finish. Yeah. Because at any moment they can stop and we can't stop. I'm glad that somebody is taking time to uh, try to understand what it is that I'm going through up in here. You know, 10 years ago, I was in a dark place up in here, Naj. I was like, damn, nobody don't care about me. Nobody don't love me. Nobody give a damn about what I'm going through up in here. And like, just the fact that people were starting to identify with uh, what we going through up in here, you might get one person, one inmate in here to change his life because of what y'all doing out there. Think of it like that. It's like when people protest in front of the prison, right, during COVID, right? Yeah. Like, let them out, let them out, let them out. Yeah. That means you care. It's empathy that got to me. There you it's go. empathy uh, being treated like go. a human being that there made me go. a human being, right? And so I love people that want, want to understand how, how it feels to go through this. And not that, like, how can somebody say um, I'm being disrespected? I don't feel like that. They can't yeah. speak for me. Anybody that's willing to eat state food for 30 days is not making fun of me. But if you're willing to do the workout, if you're willing to eat the food, if you're willing to stick to three outfits for the whole month, right? If you want to do these type of things, you're not making fun of me. You're trying to understand what I'm going through. And that's love, man. Last I heard, it's like two, 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 300 people signed up to do this and they don't have to. It's over what? a thousand now. So over a thousand people signed up to do this and they don't have to. Yeah. So I just want to say right now, we love you. And for the 200 people that are going to drop out in two weeks, I still love you because you tried. <laughs> okay, we should clarify something about how guys eat in San Quentin. The meals served in chow, those are provided by the prison. And that's what we're calling state food. But Erlon, those who can afford it, don't just rely on that. No, because when I was incarcerated, Dodge, I was eating way more than state food. Mm -hmm. And that's true for New York, Rashid, Reggie. I mean, most of the guys we talked to in there. Right. If you can afford it, you're going to supplement those menus by buying food from the package companies or going to the commissary. Because mm -hmm. that's where you get all the good shit. You know, the honey buns, the meat logs, the Snickers. Right. But for this challenge, we made a very specific rule. For us, no canteen, no quarterly packages. We were only able to eat what was served on those San Quentin menus. And there was one guy who agreed to do the same thing from inside San Quentin. Yep, Tony, our newest addition to the inside team. I mean, 
every time we sit down to eat lunch in San Quentin, Tony's got some kind of special meal that he got either at the commissary or from a catalog. So for a whole month, he was going to have to give that up. My comfort is eating. And before prison, it was self-destructiveness and, you know, harming people and not taking accountability for any of my actions. But now that I've learned a lot about myself, I've filled that with eating. And it's not like, oh, I've had, you know, five bags of almonds. It's like, no, I've, you know, eaten an entire box of Hostess Zingers Mm -hmm. in 24 hours. It's never enough. Like, I want to nosh and I want to eat. I want to just, like, satiate whatever sadness is going on in my body. But I can't. It's kind of like if you're a smoker, you know, you always put your hand to your mouth and you're always constantly eating. And it's just like I'm just constantly noshing all day long on stuff. That's my comfort in the uncomfortable. I gained 30 pounds in prison. All because of my love for honey bun. Comfort food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I totally get that. And I think it's also about control. I mean, the food you buy in commissary... You choose it, you keep right. it in your cell, and you decide when you're gonna eat it. There's no there's no schedule around that. Nah, because you know, with the child hall meals, it's a very specific schedule. Mm-hmm. Cause breakfast is at like 6.15 and you gotta go there to get your lunch, and then yep. dinner is at 5 p.m. Yeah, so between dinner and breakfast, there's 12 hours from 5.30 p.m. until 5.30 a.m. And if you don't have commissary in your cell, there's nothing to eat during that time. So since you've had an experience this, what, can, what advice can you give us? Um, you'll be extremely hungry. Seven o'clock is going to be the worst hour of the day. A.M. or P.M.? P.M. Why? It's because you really want to snack on something, but you're so hungry that you ate everything during that day. And so it's going to hurt for the first two weeks. Then after that, you get used to it. So what would you do? Starve, I mean. <laughs> but, like, what did you do to, like, occupy your mind? I try to read, but mostly I do, try to go to sleep try or drink sleep. or drink water to trick your body. Because yeah. you can get all the water you want, right? And so you try to drink water to try to, like, convince your stomach, you know, give to, it a hunger pain for a minute. Yeah. Yeah, to yeah. get full. Yeah, I wish I remember who told me this, um, that in prison you'll never starve, but you'll always be hungry. And it it's really sticks with me, and, and that seems to be the truth. I mean, you're not going to die of starvation, but you will be fucking hungry a lot of the time. Oh, man, Erlon. Over the course of that month, my relationship to the clock really changed. I mean, I was obsessed. I was always looking at it like, how long until lunch? When can I eat again? Oh, my God, six minutes till I can eat, 30 minutes till I can eat. I've never felt that way before. But I'm so hungry. Like, I'm already thinking, oh, good, we can eat lunch in 50, it's about 53 minutes. Eat that water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yesterday I had lunch and I had, I went to wash my tray. I was still so hungry. When I went to wash it, there was a little bit of a chip I found in the corner of my tray. I was so happy. <laughs> like, yes, I hate it. <laughs> And I notice as the days go by, my tray is cleaner and cleaner and cleaner before I go to wash it because I'm like eating everything. And Erlon, you even recorded an audio diary of your own on this subject. And in typical Erlon fashion, it was so loving and supportive and thoughtful. Hey, shit. It's about nine o'clock in the morning and I'm hungry. Oh, wait a minute. Man, I'm finna go get me some breakfast. I ain't, I ain't doing this challenge. What I'm tripping up? Go get me a nice breakfast, too. Orange juice, eggs, bacon, and pancakes, some cool syrup, probably some banana pancakes or something. Always appreciate you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so... The hunger I expected. But the thing I didn't expect is that because I was eating at these weird times, I became sort of like separated from my people. And it was, it was lonely. I mean, I will tell you a little bit about the eating. Um, it's lonely. 
And I think that's one of the things I think about in here is that food isn't on the outside for me. Food is about like eating with my husband or friends. And at the end of the day, like we have a drink and then we sit down and talk about the day. But now we don't have that because I eat at what, 5.15? Yeah. She doesn't eat till 7. We eat different food. Um, so all the kind of fun of eating has been taken away. So the, the ironic thing is in prison, food is about community as well. Because we celebrate, we don't have anything, right? Like if it's your birthday, you're not going to a party. Yeah. Your birthday is like this year, Rashid cooked for me. That was my birthday, right? Um, his birthday is around the corner in November. We're going to cook something. Yeah. And even when you go to the chow hall, you sit at a table with other people. And, mm. you know, it's a crowded chow hall situation. So it's, food is always bringing people together in prison. Every com- different community has its own little tables. It's like the Muslims have a terrible area. The different locations have a different terrible area. And it's really... You don't have to stick to that. Anybody can sit anywhere. But um, people, you usually conjugate with people that you, you normally like to hang out with. I hear what you're saying about eating alone, Nige. But mm-hmm. I know there were these other times, too, when eating became social in a new way for you. Like, you had your own little challenge community and shit. Over 18, mm-hmm. and this is a first... Amy, Bruce, Shabnan, and I are all eating lunch together. Holy shit, at CIR. Oh, yeah. Like, this one time when the team got together at the office and we all pulled out our identical sad little lunches. So I'm going to see the different peanut butter sandwiches. It's peanut butter and jelly. Shabnan, tell me about your... Oh, this is looking very sad. Yeah, here's my little um, peanut butter and jelly on very squishy wheat bread. And here's my banana that I took a bite off because I was really hungry. And here's my Doritos. Is that the best part? It is. It has the yeah. most flavor. Yeah. Um, I've been putting my Doritos in my sandwich yeah. to add a little bit of flavor. Totally. Anyway. Totally. I can't do it with PB and A really big difference between our food experience outside and the chow hall experience for the guys inside is that obviously we were cooking for one person, not for like a thousand, two, three thousand people, right? <laughs> yeah. Like you were buying your food at Safeway or Food Co. Like. When your menu called for chicken, it probably looked like chicken. In prison, Mm -hmm. you don't get that. You get these little hockey puck things, you know, some kind of compressed chicken product that's glued all together. You know what I'm saying? I've heard about these meals for years, but I've actually never had one because basically volunteers aren't allowed to eat in the chow hall. But for the 30-day challenge, it just felt important. So I made some requests. Yep. You called Lieutenant Robinson and made a reservation for a unique dining experience, a metal table for four. It is uh, 4.54. All right, we are heading into North Block Chow Hall. Yep. We're having dinner together for the first time. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be very interesting. I'm waiting to see how you like our food. I remember when we walked into that chow hall. It's one I've never been in before. And... It was one of the largest spaces that I've seen inside prison. Usually when I'm in prison, I'm in the like more contained spaces. So when we walked in there, there were, I don't know, seats for hundreds and hundreds of guys. And there's this line you get into and, and you walk up there to this like slot. You don't even really see a person. You just see these hands putting this tray out that you grab with the food on it. So I asked this one guy to describe what's on your tray. Pudding, banana pudding. Okay, beans. Beans. Chicken. Chicken. Green beans. Cucumber. Which one are you looking forward to? The, the, the greens, cucumber, and a pudding. And, and then the four of us, it was me, our editor Amy, Lieutenant Robinson in New York, we sat down to eat. I like the cucumber salad. This tastes really fresh. This is fresh. It seemed like they made it today. Um, the green beans are what I would expect. You know, they're probably canned, so they're, they're well cooked. Oh, Erlon. I hope this isn't going to disappoint you, but I got to be honest. I mean, it wasn't like the food was scrumptious, but it wasn't terrible, you know? I mean, it was bland. It needed salt and seasoning, but it was totally edible. I'm pretty sure that uh, Lieutenant Robinson warned everybody that you were coming into that chow hall. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I know. We wondered about that, but there's no way. I mean, you know, you go up to that slot and they're just like pushing out trays, pushing out trays. They didn't know when we were going to be there. It wasn't like they had a, ooh, here's a Nigel tray. <laughs> well, it's true. It's not terrible every night. I mean, there are some people in there who are trying, you know? 
Um, my name is Martha Garcia. I'm the Correctional Food Manager 2 here at San Quentin State Prison. Ms. Garcia has worked in food services in the California prison system for 22 years. So how many people work for you? Right now, um, I have um, one assistant, two supervisors, and nine to ten cooks. Nine to ten cooks, okay. So we are a small but mighty crew. And I wanted to say shout out to all my hard peeps at San Quentin (laughs) Food Service. Do you know how much is spent per day on food? Yes, I do. Um, We are given $3.74 a day per inmate for the three meals entirety. Break it down, I have um, $3.64 for food and $0.10 for materials like the paper bags that we use, the wax bags that we use, the paper trays that are used here at San Quentin. Does that amount seem sufficient to you? I managed to make it work. So I'm always looking for a good sale. When you guys see different things on the items, but they're not consistent, it's because I was able to find a vendor that will sell it to me at a cheap price. And that's where you see like the granola bars, the peanuts, the gummy bears, my watermelon craisins, 10 cents each. Wow. Yes. Wow. First time I've ever had asparagus was in prison. Awesome. It was was about a few months ago and I was like, well, it's healthy, let me try it. Oh my God, it's gonna be bad. And I ate it and it was delicious. And I never saw it again. So what I do for that is I wait till the summer months where it's like your asparagus is just like plethora. And that's when I get a good buy for them, and I can order it for the um, institution. So you are constantly trying to save money. Everywhere I can. I want to ask you about um, something that happened about a month ago. Mm -hmm. So they have this chicken breast. Mm -hmm. But on the yard, we call it the hockey puck. It's usually overcooked, dried out. But one day I went in there, and it was cooked to perfection. It sat on this garlic bread. It was like this perfectly golden toasted brown. And when I squeezed it, the butter just like wet my fingers. It was saturated with butter and it was delicious. The vegetables looked fresh and it was like cauliflower and broccoli and carrots. And it was like this special magical day. Who made the food that night? It would be Miss Sapal. She gives directions to the staff and she works um, one-on-one with them when it comes to the food and all that. He's talked about that bread and the butter so many times. Like, he is in love. He loves that bread more than he loves people. It comes up all the time. The understanding I'm getting, right, on days that it's not so good, it's also like you're trying to pull off a miracle every day. You're trying to feed us really good three times a day with 375. Yeah. And I don't even know how that's possible. And so I can't expect the miracle every day with your hands tied. And so... uh you might hear the complaints from me, but I know it's not your fault because you're doing the best you can with 375. I try. Okay, we're good, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you because especially someone who eats for comfort, that's definitely me. And that's definitely something that I've, uh, COVID, it's helped me get through COVID. And like, I cried a little bit during the interview because it feels like we're cared for, you know? And I will do it every day that I'm here no. at San Quentin. Well, thank you. No problem. <laughs> I'm glad to hear about this project and I'll wish the people well proceeding through this. I just completed a three year prison stint. I would be a healthy judge um, to know if someone actually followed through their freaking 30 days or not. Nige, we heard from a lot of listeners. But how many of them do you think were actually eating all those crazy meals? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't think it was a lot. Erlon, it was really hard. So I'm just not sure how many people could actually commit to it. Yeah. So we started coming up with these mini challenges. Things listeners could do for just a day or whatever. And people really got into it. That was cool to see. My name is Julia. And... I decided to wake up earlier than I prefer. Hi, my name is Lauren. Last night, I took part in the mini challenge of sleeping in my bathroom. I took with me a cushion, a pillow, a blanket, and a book. And after spending half the night trying to fall asleep, I eventually caved and went to my actual bed. Hello, this is Anna from Italy. It's now... Half past 4 p.m. Central European Standard Time, half past 7 a.m. in St. Quentin, and I'm reporting to be counted. 
I have already been to prison, spent many years, and I think I joined not so much to know what it was like, because I already do know, but to remind myself to be grateful that I am not any longer in prison. I'm sitting outside of my job as a construction worker, and it's sunshine, and I'm smoking a cigarette, and I can get in my car and go get lunch. So thank you for the opportunity to do this. Bye-bye. We heard from a listener named Rosa here in the Bay Area. Her son, Joseph, is incarcerated in Soledad, California, and she wanted to get a taste of what his life is like. So for a month, she really pulled back on a lot of her activities and lived kind of a quieter, more solitary life. And whenever her son called her, she'd fill him in on what she was up to. You know, eating at certain times, exercising at certain times, uh not going to the gym, but, you know, using what you could in your house, um, not being able to watch Netflix and, you know, whatever you felt like uh, entertainment wise, feeling the difference of how time moves, you know, you didn't do top ramen, did you? I did. I did a lot of top ramen. <laughs> oh my God. I did. All right, Ma. I did okay, a lot of top you ramen. Did it. You did the thing. I oh. need to know more. I'm going to, I'm, I'm just when I get off the phone, I can't wait to go tell a couple of my, the guys, my guys. When Rosa talked to Joseph a few days later, he'd come up with his own version of the 30-day challenge. So, I have the challenge. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. You want to write this down? I'm recording it. I'm calling it the 30-day hygiene challenge. Cheap, generic, single-ply toilet paper. Three rolls. Real cheap. Cheap, generic. Bar, bath, so you can only use the above cosmetics for the 30 day challenge period. You can only shower, no baths allowed, and showers are to be five minutes only, because that's what we're allotted. You go to your closet and you separate the following clothing items from your clothing. Room. Okay, we gotta take a break here, mm-hmm. but when we come back, Nigel. She's, yeah. how can I say this? You know, the world, y'all don't get to see this part of her. Spicy. She was really, you know, conflicted. We'll be right back. irritated um i'm really hungry i've got all this work to do for our next episode that's coming out in the episode after that and um uh, so i'm tired sheesh nice i don't get to hear you talk like that too often yeah, I mean, Erlon, you know, as the month went on, it was just really hard. I, I'd been on keto for like three years. So it was this huge change in my diet. All the shopping and the cooking took up so much time. We were super busy with the podcast. So it was easy to sometimes just get a little cranky. And it was one of those things I really wanted to go into San Quentin and talk about with uh, New York and Rashid. I have been a little bit cranky, but I've been trying to keep it to myself. But like the other night, I was watching TV with my husband, and for some reason he was narrating everything, like he was talking about everything, and inside I was like starting to boil over, and I was like, Rick, I'm just going to say this to you nicely, can you please stop doing that? I just want to enjoy the TV. But I could feel like my, like I was ready just to be like, just you shut up, I don't want to hear you running, a running narration, I just want this to unfold on its own. So, but I felt proud of myself for at least saying it nicely but inside I was raging and it was a silly thing to rage over but I was really irritated yeah so and I have I've, I have felt a little bit snappy but I've been trying to to keep it in I think I pouted a little bit at, at one of the air hustle meetings because I wasn't in a good mood <laughs> <laughs> will you guys pr- promise me that you will Tell me if I get really crabby. Like, will you say, Nigel, you're well, really being Absolutely crabby. not. No. <laughs> absolutely I'm not. I'm going to stay out your way. <laughs> Nigel, calm down. <laughs> Breathe with me. Usa. <laughs> what was that? Usa. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, I got one more thing to say. 
I just thought of something, right? Because they, they they portray prison as being this violent place full of like locked up evil people. I realized, Naj, after talking to you today, that we just hungry. <laughs> And if you could feed us, there would be no violence in prison. If we got Kentucky Fried Chicken, bring the steaks back. Yeah, there would be oh no violence God. in prison. We're yeah. just hungry. <laughs> That's so violent. funny. <laughs> Y'all yeah, know it meant a lot to those guys inside to see all y'all doing this. But I think it was also pretty damn entertaining, Nige. Really? Tell me yeah. more. I mean, for New York and Rashid and them cats, they were watching you all like some kind of reality TV show. So, any other queries about how we're doing? I gotta ask you to inform, Nodge. I hate to okay. do this. How's Bruce doing? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's doing pretty good. <laughs> Is he really, Dodge? Is he really? We saw him last week. He didn't look like he was doing very good, Dodge. Are you covering for him? <laughs> um, I think he's trying his best. We had to talk that? to Bruce. He fell off. It's Bruce around 10.30 on Wednesday, the 13th, I believe. And I just rode to the top of this hill that I ride my bike to every few days. I guess I'm 15% more winded than I used to be. How about Amy? I think Amy's doing pretty good. It's about 6.30 and I'm... I'm looking at this lump of peanut butter, and it's so unappetizing to eat a big lump of peanut butter at 6.15 in the morning. Good thing it's only for mud, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, it's October... Ooh, it's the second. And I'm at Phil's Coffee, and... Um, can you tell me who you are? My name is Michael. And what do you do? Uh, I'm a barista here at Phil's. Phil's Coffee. Mm -hmm. You took me there the first day I got out of prison. That's your spot. Yep. I've been going there every morning for years. And this brings up a question that I've been ruminating on really for a long time, even before the challenge. Oh, yeah? It's kind of an esoteric question, and it has to do with disappearing. Like, what happens when you suddenly disappear from all those daily interactions? I guess you'd say with, like, strangers. But they aren't really strangers. They're those people that you see every day when you're moving through the world. That's what happens when you go to prison, you know? A lot of people, they just don't see you around anymore. Yeah, and I mean, do those people even notice that you're gone? So I come in here every day. I always get the same cup of coffee. And I was wondering, if I didn't come in for 30 days or a month, would you notice that I was gone? Um... And, and be honest. Yes. I will, uh, I would notice that you'd be gone for if it's been 30 days. And I'll start to get the wondering. Yeah, what would you think might have happened to me? You probably went to a new cafe or you probably moved or, you know, you probably taken a break from coffee. Who knows? <laughs> uh, would you ever think anything negative could have happened? Uh -huh. I wouldn't want to put that. I, I wouldn't want to put that in the atmosphere. You know, I would think something you would probably do something better. Okay. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you talking to me. So do I have your permission to potentially put this in the podcast? Yes, you got my permission. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, thanks again for no giving me some time, and uh, I'll see you in November. All right. See you in November. Okay. Have a good one. Thanks. Thank you. On one of my visits to San Quentin, I ran this idea by New York and Rashid. I have a lot of routines. Like I told you, I go get coffee every day. And I was wondering if people who know me in that way, they're not friends, will they even notice I'm gone? And I wonder, did you ever think about that when you went to prison? Like not people that are friends, but did people notice that you were gone? I was invisible, Naj. Nobody even knew I was there. <laughs> Why do you think that? I was always low key. And then half the time I was on a run. So I made a point to be low key. But did you like do anything every day? Or was it like we went to buy a newspaper? Number you had no one patterns. rule of being on a run. You no, had no patterns. patterns. So I, I can't even remember a place I frequent. Yeah. And the places I did were like really crowded places like Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles or Jerry's Deli, where yeah. there's so many people who I'm sure no waitress or no cashiers. Wondering where the tall, light-skinned cat, cat went. The closest to a routine I might have had is I, I went to this 24-hour fitness at weird hours. I like to go, like, in, in late at night when it's mm -hmm. not crowded so I can jump from machine to machine. Yeah. And there was, this, there was this one lady at the counter that was really he he hella friendly. Maybe she's wondering I wonder if she might have wondered. 
you got me going back to high school, like riding the same train every morning, yeah. going to school. You see a lot of the same people in the morning yeah. when you get on the car at the same time. I don't know them, but I just know their face from that every day in the morning. So just missing them one day, I, I wonder like where they at, or did I miss my the normal train? Like we would ride the bus. And we would see the same people on the bus consistently. Mm -hmm. And then when you didn't see one of them, he was like, man, like, where's the old man with the big coat, man yeah. with the hat? You know what I mean? Like, So there's probably a lot of more people out there than you think that might have been like, what happened to that tall guy? Yeah. What happened to the, as you describe yourself, the light-skinned yeah. guy? <laughs> <laughs> the invisible type light-skinned yeah. guy. Now we all know I'm at San Quentin State Prison. <laughs> this, is how, this is how I disappeared. <laughs> Save my seat on the train. One thing I'm going through now is kind of a positive thing. Most people are going home. Mm -hmm. And now it feels like most of my closest friends are home. I know, so people are going home and that's great. And I, I know you're happy for them, but it's also a loss for you. It would be like just, if, you know, it's the same thing on the outside of people yeah. that were just were gone all of a sudden that were part of my, it's, it's not easy. Well, at first I was just too happy for them. And then, then when it's so many left, now it's like, damn, who do I really hang out with? Now I start to feel kind of lonely. Yeah. I feel like I'm supposed to be with that group out there. Yeah. And so now it feels kind of left behind-ish. It might not be too far in the future where you're the person who disappears. I hope, I hope. Do you have a spork? A what? A spork. Yeah. What does your spork look like? What color is it? It's orange. It's a mix between a fork and a spoon. Do you have a spork and do you carry it around with you? Do I have a sport? Uh, yeah, basketball. How many sporks have you had since you've been down? Since I've been to prison, one. Describe it. Pretty self-explanatory, a spork, a spoon with, with little fork tips, you know? I don't think people in the street have things like that. I've never seen a spork in, in society. You know, I never have neither, but I mean, uh, you know, it's kind of best of both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> so that box you all received at the start of this challenge, it had recipes and menus, but some other stuff too. It sure did. If we were going to be eating San Quentin meals, we had to eat them the San Quentin way. Absolutely. With a tray and a spork. Yep. A plastic tray, tumbler, and spork. Those objects became really important to me over the course of the 30 days. And I wanted to see what New York and Tony inside San Quentin had to say about them. And then we've got what's here. That is a, a red spork. A red spork. And that is a red uh, tumbler. Do, what do you think of the texture? I like it. Me too. Why? Why do you like it? I don't know. It feels comfortable in my hand. What do you think, Tony? This, is, this feels so strange. It feels so intimate. It's like I'm looking into a, a piece of you. It's so weird. Wait, why, is it, why does it feel intimate? Because it, it's, it's yours. Right? Yeah. It's so funny that you have this reaction to it because that's how I did. I felt it felt so human to me. It felt very feminine. Like I, I, I couldn't really explain the attachment that I had to these three objects. Yeah. It's uh, September 24th. It's about 6 a.m. I was just thinking about <laughs> my spork and my plastic tumbler. Those are mine. Those are my things. And um, I, 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 I'm suspecting that over the month, saying those are my things, um, that expression is going to have more importance somehow. And um, I want to talk to New York about that today. So do you always carry your spork with you? Yeah, it's in my pocket right now. If you don't show up with your own spork or spoon, you are eating with your fingers, which happens a lot to guys who forgot, ah, I forgot, let me borrow your spoon. No, it's COVID. <laughs> Be like an Ethiopian, use your fingers. <laughs> can I see your, can you unwrap your spoon? Yeah. <laughs> it feels very important to me. It's, 
definitely make a yeah. Oh yeah. Oh my god, look at it. It's like mom and dad. Yep, yep. <laughs> Hey, 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 hey. Hello. How you doing? So, so <laughs> New, down there. <laughs> New York's is yellow and it's about a head taller and it's a spoon. They actually look like a really nice couple. They match, mustard. don't they? So the one they actually give us <laughs> is brown. This is a, a, a canteen spoon I bought. I think the yellow is preferable to the brown. It's way better. It's yeah. bigger, it's stronger. And it's cheery. It's better, yeah. I love this spoon. Yeah. And so how many think you've gone through? Ooh. Sometimes they fall out of my pocket, I lose them. I'm not exactly sure, maybe 10. And how long? Uh, um, I would say in 18 years. That's pretty amazing, actually. If they don't break, if I don't lose them, they'll stay with me forever. Might bring one home. But yeah, I can't think of any other item that I keep around me so much. So that sound, just to mark it, was... Um... The spoon getting wrapped up all carefully and putting back in his pocket. Yeah. I want to ask you a tough question. Yeah. So, I killed somebody, Nigel. I'm in prison because I killed somebody. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I struggled with remorse about it because I felt like it was self-defense. But then I had to realize... I put myself in the position to need to be defended and then ran and didn't handle If I wasn't a criminal, it would have never happened. Nobody be dead. And so part of the reason why I'm here is punishment. Mm -hmm. And so one thing about the 30 day challenge that I really love, it feels up like empathy. But what would you say that the people that, that say that we don't necessarily deserve empathy? Man, I think empathy and, and being open to other people's experiences is the, is the best way you can be as a human. Like, I don't understand how the world moves forward without empathy and wanting to understand someone else's experience. So you might be an example of this or other people in prison. You know your worst, darkest side, and you know your brightest, lightest side. And like, how amazing is that to know yourself in such a three-dimensional way? Most, a lot of people haven't really explored their darkest side that everybody has. And I think people like you and Tony, who are doing work, have had that opportunity to go really deep into what it means to be a complicated human. Well, prison's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to just clear everything off, um, all the distractions away, and just sit with yourself, and just really just sit with your own thoughts, because I think a lot of people don't do that. So prison forces you to, to, to face yourself the reason why it's not the ideal place to do it is it's, it can be a dangerous, depressing. It can. I've seen people be in prison too long and break. I mean, it, it's it's a gamble whether uh, you get these positive results, yeah, right? Totally. Um, prison for most people. Um, well, I won't say most, but I say a lot of people. They come on better criminals instead of better people. Mm. And the more you treat people like animals, the more animal they act like. The more you treat them like human beings, the better they become. On one of the last days of October, I went to San Quentin, Erlon, and I saw Tony, right? You remember him, the mm -hmm. one guy inside mm -hmm. who was taking part of the challenge. And you know what? Hey. He, he did it. He made it through the entire month. The first two weeks were horrible. I wanted to break it so badly right then. Because yeah. I, I always fail at things and give up on certain things, right? And like, I'm tired of that. I'm tired of being that person that says if I'm going to do this, like, I am i don't come through with it. Like, really, like, I want to be a different person, so I'm not, I don't want to be the flake. So now that you are this different person who is not a flake, how do you feel? I guess we have to wait to see what the results are, right? I mean, ask me again in a month. Okay. See if I'm still doing the same thing. But right now, how do you feel about your success? I'm kind of proud of myself. It's November 3rd, and it's uh, 7 a.m. Uh, first day of not doing the 30-day challenge, or I should say 
the end of the 30 day challenge, I'm back to my regular life. So I slept in a little bit. Erlon, I mean, I thought this month was going to feel like <laughs> ever, <laughs> but as the month came to a close, I have to be honest, like, actually it was, it was kind of hard to end it. I knew that was going to happen. Instead of today feeling exciting, like, oh my God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. My mind is more focused on, oh, what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to have my breakfast on that flesh colored, white flesh colored tray. I'm not going to be eating everything with my red spork. Um, I'm not going to be putting on the same clothes. Uh, I'm not going to be eating dinner at 5.30. I'm probably not going to have the excitement of running into San Quentin on Friday and discussing what's happening with the 30-day challenge because it's over. I'm a little sad. I'm a little sad that it's over. I'm not excited. I didn't wake up excited thinking, wow, I can go to Phil's Coffee. I can put on whatever I want. Um, I don't have to go exercise. I'm going to kind of miss it. Ooh, first sip of water out of a glass. Anyway, end of the 30-day challenge. So lots of not doing today. And I suppose at some point I'll get to the the doing today. Irasso would like to thank Reggie Thorpe, Elton Spencer, Jason Robinson, Garcia Anicasio, and Seneca Terrell. Thanks also to Rosa Warder and Joseph Whitaker Davis, and Michael and the team at Fields in Dog Patch for letting Niger record in there. Big thanks also to Ms. Sapoa in the San Quentin Kitchen, as well as Casey, Julia, Lauren, Jamie. Anna, and all of the listeners who posted on Instagram and Facebook, and everyone who gave the 30-day challenge a try. This episode of Ear Hustle was produced by Nigel Poor and Amy Standen, with Erlon Woods, Rassan New York Thomas, John Yaya Johnson, Rashid Zineman, Bruce Wallace, and Tony Tafoya. It was sound designed and engineered by Antoine Williams with music by Antoine, David Jassy, and Rashid Zineman. Shabnam Sigmin is our digital producer, and Julie Shapiro is the executive producer for Radiotopia. We'd also like to thank Warden Ron Bloomfield. And as you know, every episode of Ear Hustle has to be approved by this guy here. So, Lieutenant Robinson, tell me, how do you feel about this 30-day challenge? I'll tell you, I was really uh, surprised by how Nigel broke, right? <laughs> Bro, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Giving a husband a hard time. You know, he's, he's just sitting around trying to hang out and have a good time. And, and Talk about goes, the movie. And she go, you know, experience. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the episodes I really do appreciate how people, for everyone who took the time out to really dive in and just experience some aspect of it, right? Much respect for me. So with that, I will say that this is Lieutenant Sam Robinson, the public information officer at San Quentin State Prison, and I do approve this episode. This podcast was made possible with support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, working to redesign the justice system by building power and opportunity for communities impacted by incarceration. Your Hustle is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. Radiotopia is a collection of independent, listener-supported podcasts. Some of the best podcasts around. Hear more at radiotopia.fm. I'm Erlon Woods. And I'm Nigel Poor. Thanks Thanks for for listening. listening. No, I know. Discretion is advised. Can you start over? Yeah, just start. Okay, just start over. Okay. This is Rick Peterson, Nigel's husband. The following episode of Ear Hustle contains language that may not be appropriate for all listeners.
discretion advised. Okay, you gotta do it again, please. I know. Radiotopia. From PRX.